Good morning, Calvary friends and guests. It is truly a pleasure to be with you on this glorious Good Friday. This is a day that, from a Paulinian perspective, is of most importance in the Christian faith. It is a day that many theologians believe to be the turning point for all creation due to the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. This is a day that we set aside to commemorate, to remember the day that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ willingly suffered, died, and made the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. This is the day, my brothers and sisters, that on that old rugged cross, after being beaten, battered, and bruised, Christ, before he breathed his last breath, uttered, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. A day that a spirit of forgiveness should be birthed or renewed within us and poured out into an unforgiving world. So today I want to speak with you about a simple concept that is a powerful act and sometimes yet hard to do. You got it. Forgiveness. All too often within our society, we think it to be a sign of weakness to forgive. We have to prove to everybody and their mama that we won't be taken advantage of. We have to show how big and bad and how tough, how honorary, how stubborn, how bullheaded we really are. But may I submit to you that it shows more strength, more heart, and more courage to forgive those who have done us wrong than it does to be unforgiving. I like the way Gandhi said it. The weak can never forgive, but forgiveness is an attribute of the strong. So I'm sorry to burst your bubble here, but forgiveness is not for the faint of hearts. You have to be strong to truly forgive those who have done you wrong. You have to work through the hurt, work through the pain, work through the emotions that was caused by the action or inaction of the one who did you wrong. And get this, sometimes the one who hurts, you, who hurts you the worst is you. Come on now. I know that's another sermon for another time for another day, but I only got two more minutes to tell you what I got to tell you, then I'm out of here. So forgiveness is truly a Christian virtue. Forgiveness is not an act. It is indeed a way of life. You can't pick and choose who you're going to forgive. You are to forgive all those within your circle. Forgive all those that have trespassed against you. Forgive all those who are within your sphere of influence. Now, over the course of my life, I have seen the devastation of unforgiveness, how it creates bitterness and how that bitterness becomes poison and how it poisons not only the individual, but every member of the family, everyone within their uh, sphere of influence. Friends destroy, marriage is torn asunder. It even impacts your walk with God. Now, when you fail to forgive the one who, who has hurt you, you are forever tethered to them, that situation, and to your past. Unforgiveness imprisons you. It shackles you. It bounds you. Unforgiveness keeps that pain alive. It keeps that sore open. It doesn't allow time for things to heal. It becomes cancerous to a large degree. But the power of forgiveness is freeing. It's liberating. It frees ones from their past, opens closed doors. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. The power of forgiveness is it, it, it transforms lives. Many of us may say, if only the people who hurt me would show some remorse, show some sorrow, then maybe I would be able to forgive them. But since that rarely happens, we use that as an excuse to continue in our own bitterness, in our anger, in our desire to get even. But vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Now consider Jesus on the cross. No one seemed very sorry, even as he said those words. The crowd laughed, mocked, cheered, jeered. Those who passed by hurled insults at him. They taunted him. If you are the king of Israel, come down from that cross and save yourself. Now, let's be clear. When he died, the people who put him there or who put him to death weren't apologetic at all. But on the contrary, they were quite pleased with themselves. Pilate washed his hands of the entire affair. Jewish leaders hated him with a fierce, irrational hatred. The crowd was happy to see him suffer and die. It was in the air that day. The forces of darkness had done their work, and the Son of God would soon be in the tomb. No one ever said, my bad, my mistake, forgive me. And yet he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is precisely what we must say if we want to follow Christ. We must say it to people who hurt us. We must say it to those who attack us. We must say it to those who wounded us, who abandoned us, who didn't fight for us, or who lied to us. We must say it to those who are closest to us, to our husbands, to our wives, to our children, to our parents, to our friends, to our neighbors, to our brothers and sisters, to our fellow Christians. It is our moral obligation as Christians to forgive. Now, I hear you. You're saying, that's a tall order, Doc. I don't, I don't know if I got it in me. I ain't built like that. So, so here's the question. How do you forgive when you don't have it in you or don't have the power to forgive? Well, my time's up now. But the answer is in the text. Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. Now, this is my interpretation of the text. Jesus didn't say, I forgive you. When the physical manifestation of the Trinity was badly bruised, beaten, and broken, he cried out and spoke directly to his Father who had the power to forgive. So when somebody comes at you the wrong way, does you wrong, slanders your name, your reputation, hurts your feelings, bruises your ego, breaks your heart, you cry out, you yell out, Father, forgive them, because I don't have it in me right now. 
Be my intercessor. Stand in my place because I know your strength is made perfect in my weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. For when I am weak, you got it, then I am strong. The power of forgiveness. Good afternoon to all of you, my sisters and brothers. My assignment is the second word that Jesus uttered from the cross. Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. In this second word spoken by Jesus from the cross, God does not want us to be ignorant but wants us to be saved. For although Jesus was numbered among the transgressors, there is a matter of certain and eternal destiny. There are three crosses on that rugged hill, one for the hopeless, one for the hopeful, and one for hope. Three men died on that skull. One was saying, if you are Christ, save yourself and us. One was saying, we indeed justly receive the due reward of our deeds. And the last was saying, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Three things to remember. Number one, Jesus died forgiving the sins of others. After they nailed him to that old rugged cross, he stopped dying long enough to call his father on behalf of the crucifiers. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Secondly, no man took Jesus' life. He gave it up. He had told us, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the father but by me and I lay down my life for the sheep. He could have summoned legions of angels. He could have come down from the cross to save himself, but he went on the rugged cross willingly. And then thirdly, Jesus wanted to take someone with him to his father's kingdom. So although this second male factor was a thief, and no doubt was not a regular at the local synagogue, Jesus made sure he had salvation and would spend eternity with him. The thief admitted his wrongdoings, called on Jesus, and Jesus saved him. No matter how far you and I are down the road toward the pig pen, we can come to our senses and go back home. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 19, verse 26, 27. And this is what it says. When Jesus looked and saw his mother at the foot of the cross, he said, One, behold thy son. And then he said unto the disciple in verse 27, Behold thy mother. And the Bible declared from that hour forth, he took Mary unto his house. I don't know if he took her right then or there because she was grieving and he didn't want her to go through any more pain. But for a mother to look upon her son, suffering at the hands of the Roman soldier, while he was in agony, while he was in pain, while he, it seemed like he was defeated, but we know as Christian that he, he conquered death. Amen. And the Bible declared that he went to the grave, and on the third day he rose up and gave all power in his hand. But what Jesus was doing, he was, he was establishing a spiritual relationship between Mary and John that had no blood relationship while he was severing his ties, his earthly ties, with his mother. While in the midst of him being 100% God, 100% man, Jesus took it up on himself to make provision for his mother and where she's going to live and, and be taken care of. And this is what we have to do as saints. We have to continue to look beyond ourselves and look, to, and look at the needs of other people. And stop thinking just about me, 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 I, I. God, Jesus himself, even while taking care of his eternal business, 
he was had the mindset to be provisioned for his mother. And the Bible says, honor thy mother and thy father. And this is a command, not a suggestion. And so we here, I'm here to let you know that God is able to meet your need while he take care of his own business. Well, you take care of God's business, he'll take care of your business. This is the third sin from the cross of Jesus Christ. And we just say we love you, God loves you, and he's able to take care of whatever you're going through. He's able to meet your needs in the midst of your storm. He's able to conquer all, he have conquered all things. And if you're in Jesus Christ, you're more than conquered through him who strengthened you. Be blessed and stay safe. <laughs>
let your healing reign. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hello, my brothers and sisters. Today we are talking about the last seven words that Jesus Christ has spoke. And in one of the last seven words that Jesus spoke, he spoke about thirst. And in John, in the book of John 19 and 28, it spoke about thirst. And it says, after this, Jesus, knowingly that all things were now completed, at the scripture must be fulfilled. I thirst. See, Jesus said the scripture must be fulfilled. He said, knowingly, all things are now complete. See, Jesus was talking about thirst. He was not talking about the same type of water that me and you think about when we are thirsty. He was thinking about our salvation. He was talking about our salvation, how to get us closer to him. For an example, I'll tell you a story about, I'll tell you a story that's in the Bible. It was about a Samaritan woman that was thirsty and was thirsting for Jesus. And this lady, she, 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 she was going up to the well to get some water. And as she was going up to the well to get some water, she noticed that Jesus was sitting next to the well. She was a little puzzled. She kind of looked over there and she was like, mm, what is he doing here this time of day? She normally goes up to the well because she's going up to the well by herself. But see, sometimes we try to go up to the well by ourselves and we don't take Jesus with us. See, my brothers and sisters, sometimes we need Jesus. Sometimes we just need that living water to help us get through what we're going through. See, right now we're going through this coronavirus. Sometimes we're just going through some things at home, just some just everyday problems. Our husbands, our wives, our kids. But we don't understand that God has this living water for us. And all we have to do is learn how to draw the water and get closer to Jesus for we know how to draw the water out of the well. See, when Jesus asked the lady for a drink of water, she said, well, you don't have a vessel. You don't have a vial. You don't have something to put the water in. But listen to this. She didn't understand that what Jesus was saying to her is that you are the vessel and I am the water. So Jesus are trying to give us the living water. See, at, at the end of the scripture, at the end of the scripture, he said, I thirst. See, in order to have fulfill the scripture, Jesus had to ask for that water. He had to ask for the water, for them to give him the water for he can fulfill the scripture. See, right now, we're struggling right now. We're struggling with this coronavirus. We're struggling with a whole lot of things in our lives. And all we have to do is get closer to Jesus because that's what he was seeking for. He was seeking us to get closer to him. That's why he had the living water for us. So I'm here to tell you today, brothers and sisters, that we have to get in these times right now, we need to get closer to Jesus. We need to pick this book up and understand what the living water is. In Jesus name, I pray that we walk together, we talk together. And we learn about what the living water is. Thank you. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My assignment was the sixth word from the cross from Christ. John 19 and 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What is finished? It is the work of salvation. And what is salvation, you ask? Theology as a Christian says, the deliverance from sin. 
and its consequences believed by Christians to be brought about by faith in Christ. You see, in the Old Testament, every year we had to make sacrifice for our sin as well as the priest, as well as he did it for the people, using sacrifices, using the, the blood of bulls and goats. And that just covered our sins because we always had uh, a memory of it. The conscience of our sin was always revisited every year. And so Christ came down to pay the ultimate price for us with his life. See, with the blood of an unblemished sacrifice who God prepared, as he tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, he washed our sins away, past, present, and future, through grace, something we didn't deserve. Because as it says in Hebrews 2 and 5, the fear of death kept us in bondage. And so Christ gave us eternal life. So for a Christian, to die is the gateway to eternal life, for we are just pilgrims passing through a strange land. Christ also taught us to pray, as he did in the Lord's Prayer. And so we know how to maintain our salvation because what many people don't realize is you can't lose your salvation. You can only lose the joy of your salvation. As it says in Psalm 51, when David was pleading with God to forgive him. And so as Christians, we should remember the price that God's son paid for us is something we should always take to heart. So he taught us how to pray he became a living sacrifice to wash away our sins for past, present, and future. And he also left us the comforter, the spirit of truth. So God and his son would always dwell with us, no matter where we were, no matter what we did. And as long as we confess, as it says in Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Herbert Lockyer says in his book, The Last Words of Saints and Sinners, that last words should take our or give us our most undivided attention, for they speak in volumes. This is the last word of our Savior, Jesus Christ. On the cross of Calvary, Luke chapter 23, verse 46, Jesus says, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. Father, which suggests that Jesus has a relationship with God at his darkest hour. This last word is about the art of dying. How Jesus died and how he prayed in his darkest hour. Jesus says, Father, which suggests he has a relationship with God. Even as the sun refused to shine at the darkest hour, he still has a relationship. But it also teaches us of how to trust God in our darkest hour. He says, into thine hands, into thine hands. The Bible uses body parts, anthropomorphism to describe God. We know that God doesn't have physical body parts. God is a spirit, but he attaches hands or feet, or eyes, or ears to help us understand how he navigates his relationship with us throughout this pilgrimage of faith. He says, into thine hands I commend. That word commend means I deposit. Jesus is saying in his final words, Father, although it's dark and I'm dying, I trust you. I trust your hands. Your hands are safety. Your hands are protective. Into thine hands I commend my spirit. Jesus is saying he's preaching, he's praying at this final word, and he teaches us this vital lesson that in our darkest hour, there are times that we cannot trace his hand, yet we have to trust his heart. You can't trust everybody in your darkest hour, but you can trust God. Here are three things to walk away with, with this final word. Jesus is teaching, preaching, praying to us. This is a prayer on his lips. First of all, it is important in our darkest hour, even through COVID-19, that we have a relationship with the Father. His first words of his ministry echo his last words of ministry. His first words of ministry, Luke 2, 49, I must be about my father's business. Now, as he lay dying on the cross, he says, Father, into thine hands I commend my spirit. Three things. Number one. We have to have a relationship with God in our darkest hour, in our brightest hours. But in our darkest hours, we must realize that only God can bring us through. Father, into thine hands. 
It's about relationship with God. But then second of all, this last, last word is about trusting God. I will trust in the Lord with all of my heart and lean not into my own understanding. It's about depositing whatever I'm dealing with into the hands of God. While we're trying to figure it out, God has already worked it out. It's all in his hands. But thirdly, this passage is about prayer. Jesus dies before he's resurrected with prayer on his lips. Prayer is the answer, but faith unlocks the doors. Prayer suggests not only relationship, it suggests restoration, reconciliation, and revelation. Jesus died with prayers on his lips. And this last word is a reminder that God has the whole world in his hands. God bless you.